Good afternoon, everyone on the line. Uh, welcome to our webinar on the CFPB structure to be tested by the Supreme Court. Uh, we have to cover a few preliminary matters um, before we dive into our presentation, and we will leave time at the end for questions. Uh, as, as you can see on our opening slide, we have five presenters today. Um, and on the next slide, we just need to cover sort of our welcome, uh, let everyone know that this presentation will be uh, recorded and will be available on Venable.com next week. Uh, please follow uh, the on-screen prompts for submitting questions, contacting us. Uh, we have to let you know it does not create an attorney-client relationship. I'm sure many of you on the phone are aware of these disclosures, but we have to go ahead and restate them. Uh, while Venable would like to hear from you, uh, we cannot represent anyone, and we receive if we receive com uh, or receive any confidential information from you until we know that we have uh, to, until, excuse me, until we know that any proposed representation would be appropriate and acceptable and would not create any conflict of interest. Accordingly, please do not send Venable or any of us here on this uh, call or webinar any confidential information. This presentation, this presentation is for general informational purposes only and does not represent and is not intended to provide legal advice or opinion and should not be relied on as such. Legal advice can be provided only in response to specific fact situations. This presentation does not represent any undertaking to keep uh, recipients advised as to all or any relevant legal developments. Um, and, and again, uh, this can be considered attorney advertising. I'll take a, a, a brief minute to just walk through the CLE credit and then I'll introduce myself and the other uh, presenters here as well. Um, we have been approved for CLE credit. Uh, a code will be distributed through the question and answer chat section at the end of the program, so please stay on the webinar until that if you are seeking CLE credit. Um, we have been approved for a variety of states, which I will not walk you through, but it, it covers all of, the, all of the states that most people on this call would be seeking CLE credit for. Uh, the presenters here uh, today are a number of us from the CFPB, uh, veterans of, of the agency, and uh, uh, others who have significant experience in consumer financial services, uh, ranging from government investigations to providing regulatory compliance advice. Uh, and I will take just a brief second and let everyone uh, say hello and introduce themselves real quickly. Let's start with uh, me. I am Jerry Sachs. I will be moderating uh, this webinar today. I uh, formerly worked with the CFPB's enforcement office. Uh, at the start of the CFPB and had also prior to that worked at the Federal Trade Commission prosecuting a variety of consumer protection cases. Let's just go in alphabetical order and we'll go to Andy. So, hi, this is Andy Arculin. I'm a partner in Venable's office in D.C. and also a former CFPB alum. I was in the CFPB's regulatory office from 2012 um, until 2015 when I joined Venable. My practice is primarily regulatory. I do some, some enforcement, some transactional work as well. I'm in the area of consumer financial services, I'm focusing on consumer loans, mortgages, um, and uh, other types of credit. Going to Meredith. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith Boylan. I'm a partner in the litigation group here at Venable. I focus on consumer financial work, including CFPB investigations and um, responding to CIDs and other requests for information. And I advise clients um, in the lending, servicing, and other related financial services spaces. Thank you, Meredith. And Jonathan, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. Jonathan Pompan, co-chair of the Consumer Financial Services Group here at Venable, and looking forward to today's conversation, which is one that, in some cases, many folks have called us and said, well, what does this mean for us? And in other cases, people want to know what it means for others. Um, and regardless of where you fall on this, I think today's topic is going to be one um, that's going to be very meaningful and impactful for any player in the consumer financial services space and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Peter, last but definitely not least, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, Peter Frischat, an associate at Venable in our regulatory group, uh, focusing primarily on uh, financial services, consumer financial services, uh, compliance, uh, regulation, and, and a little bit uh, of enforcement activity as well. Thank you, everyone. Now let's uh, get to the, the topics that we're here to hear about today. Uh, we are going to cover uh, the 
obviously the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We'll briefly cover uh, an overview of the agency, um, but we won't dive too deep into that. Many on this call, I, I will assume, are, are familiar with the CFPB, but we will uh, give you the basics. Uh, we will discuss challenges to the constitutionality of the CFPB, the SALA law, LLC versus CFPB. I want everyone on the call to note that I did watch a YouTube video to learn how to pronounce that correctly, so we are in good standing with that. Uh, I'm going to discuss the effects of the uh, of a, the effects of an unconstitutional CFPB and the arguments about the bureau's structure. Uh, in particular, we're going to discuss how that may impact enforcement actions, uh, both through the CFPB and state uh, enforcement activity and litigation. We'll discuss how it may impact supervisory activity at the CFPB, and rulemaking activity. So let's start with a, a brief background of the CFPB. Uh, I, you know, I, this is not on our slide, but um, uh, I, I always like to point out that the CFPB was created out of what was uh, the largest recession in the economy since the Great Depression. Uh, uh, it was uh, sort of started from the mortgage market meltdown that, that m many people in fact, probably everyone in the country had some impact from. Uh, and as a result of that, an independent agency was created by Congress uh, to regulate consumer financial products and services on a, let's just call it a consolidated um, uh, level where, where one agency could regulate all products across, across the spectrum of consumer financial services, including having supervisory oversight. Uh, the, there is a mission, mission statement for the CFPB that it, the CFPB is designed to ensure that federal consumer financial laws are enforced consistently so that consumers may access markets for financial products and so that these markets are fair, transparent, and competitive. Uh, the mission statement is, is uh, revised frequently depending on, on the directors of the agency. Uh, the CFPB's authority is pretty extensive. Uh, it has exclusive authority to enforce federal consumer financial laws against non-depository covered persons, we'll call them non-banks, and exclusive federal consumer law uh, supervisory authority and primary enforcement authority over insured depository financial institutions with over $10 billion in assets. The non-bank authority uh, uh, that the supervisory side and the enforcement side have uh, do overlap but are, uh, are not uh, entirely overlapping. It's more of like a Venn diagram. Uh, the non-bank authority generally covers mortgage origination, mortgage servicing, small dollar lending, debt collection, credit reporting, auto finance, and, and payments companies. And I'm going to let uh, Andy chime in with a little bit of additional background. So one, one thing I'd add, because it, it, it foreshadows some of the issues that we're going to be talking about, Jerry made the point that the CFPB was created in the wake of the financial crisis through the Dodd-Frank Act. There was a, a, a strong intent behind Congress making the CFPB very independent. There was a prevailing view at the time that the other financial regulators had dropped the ball, so to speak, and it failed to prevent the financial crisis. Um, many in Congress and many advocates to Congress made the case that the agencies were, quote, captive agencies, that they were essentially answering to the industry, that they weren't appropriately independent, and they weren't appropriately powerful. So the CFPB was created to be a strong independent agency for that reason. And that's, that does raise some of the issues that we'll be discussing about the director structure and so on. But I, I wanted to make sure we, we laid that groundwork. Andy, would you say that it's, it was purposeful or that it's an integral part of the Dodd-Frank Act that the director is, A, both independent uh, and, B, only removable for cause? Well, I, I think there's there's certainly a view that it is, um, but that's that's one of the issues that needs to be litigated. Exactly right. And uh, Jonathan, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, you know, what's interesting here too is is you had uh, an agency that was created uh, fresh from whole cloth, and intentionally has been has been pointed out um, covers non banks and banks. Federal Trade Commission, for instance, which had consumer protection authority over non banks, did not have the ability to go after banks. You had banking agencies that had Section 5 FTC Act authority, but actually rarely used it, uh, certainly did not publicize the use in any respect uh, to the degree that the uh, CFPB did. And you also had what is a sort of a perfect storm. You had uh, non-banks for the first time coming under supervisory authority on a federal level um, that they hadn't previously seen before. So well, many on the phone certainly lived through an era where you were ramping up compliance departments, building out systems 
in organizations that did not have that, maybe weren't even designed for that. And at the same time, you had an over-aggressive CFPB uh, put in place with an enforcement mantra of regulation through enforcement that was throwing people's backs against the wall through um, their enforcement actions and in, in the supervisory context through the examinations where it then led to, and we'll see this in a moment, you know, a, any number of organizations feeling that they simply had no choice but to challenge the authority of the organization rather than uh, the merits on the facts or even in the interpretation of the underlying law that was being used against them. And uh, you know, in many respects, what we're talking about today, this constitutional challenge, it's not the first time somebody brought one, um, but it's also, in many respects, the, um, the, the CFPB's own makings. Um, it, it pushed people to go to this extreme position of saying, look, you're unconstitutional. And thank you, Jonathan. And we will dive into that in a little bit when we talk about the PHH case briefly, where um, the CFPB took some, some uh, very outlandish positions, uh, to put it straightforwardly. Uh, the, the, as Andy and Jonathan both, both mentioned, um, just to cover briefly, the structure of the CFPB, it is uh, technically part of the Federal Reserve System. It's, it's independent. Um, it was an independent executive agency, but again, under the Federal Reserve System. Uh, quite often people state that taxpayer funds are funding the CFPB, just to be clear. It's the Federal Reserve Board funds, uh, Federal Reserve Board fees that are, are funding the CFPB, um, and, and which is also a different issue that, that you will hear frequently raised throughout Congress um, as something that is needs or may or should be changed with regards to the Bureau. Uh, the Bureau specifically has a single director that serves a five-year term and can only be removed for cause, and the for cause provision specifically states for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office, um, uh, which are pretty high standards, uh, to, uh, well, or, or pretty should be pretty difficult to, to meet. Um, and, and so as a result, as Jonathan mentioned, there have been a number of challenges to the constitutionality of the CFPB. There's been more than two dozen uh, separate challenges. Uh, in fact, uh, we find in our practice it's quite common to, at this point, always assert uh, some type of constitutionality challenge to the CFPB to preserve your rights uh, if you're not going to push that through to the Supreme Court on, on appeal as the SALA law firm did. Um, but this, this entire SALA law firm and uh, sort of challenge and the constitutionality of the CFPB really stemmed from one case uh, that made it uh, clear through what is now a dissenting opinion uh, by a current associate justice of the Supreme Court when he was a circuit court judge in the D.C. Circuit, uh, and that comes from the PHH case. Uh, Andy, you know, knowing your mortgage background and having worked on, on TILA RESPA, RESPA issues at the Bureau, and, and Peter, your background working as well in the mortgage origination and servicing, I thought I would turn this over to you all to, to give a background to our listeners as to the, the PHH case. Sure, ha happy to do that. So, in, in a way, the the facts of the PHH case are irrelevant to the constitutional issue, but in a way, they're not. Um, so, I, I'm going to spend some time covering them. I think the the nexus between the two of them, Jonathan touched on, which is the CFPB was, and it, this is back. We're, we're going to go back in time to 2014 when the CFPB was at the height of its aggressive enforcement, um, <laughs> it, its aggressive enforcement mo, and was constantly being accused of rewriting the law through enforcement. Um, there was a company, PHH Mortgage, still around. They had entered into captive mortgage reinsurance arrangements with mortgage insurance companies. These are, to, to make a long story short, loans where mortgage insurance is required to originate it because the down payment, the loan to value ratio isn't enough for, for it to be uh, uninsured. And more or less, there is a construct where a, an affiliate of PHH Mortgage was allowed to reinsure um, by the mortgage insurance company that was referred. There's an anti-kickback statute called RESPA. Um, RESPA prohibits any payments for referrals, 
And well before the CFPB existed, this was an this was an area of some controversy. There, um, there was a theory, especially before the market melted down and insurance claims were actually being paid, that this was basically free money for the for the originator that it got in exchange for referring to to, an, to a mortgage insurance company. But HUD, the agency that owned the Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act, RESPA, prior to the CFPB, had actually issued guidance on this subject um, back, in, um, uh, back in 1997 that the industry had been following ever since that, that advised on how to construct a mortgage reinsurance arrangement in a manner that did not violate RESPA and so on. Um, there were class actions and other cases that had tested those theories, but more or less, we got to 2014 and the CFPB was pursuing a RESPA action against PHH on the ground that this construct that it had with the, with the mortgage insurance provider violated RESPA. Um, that, you know, that was one area of controversy because the CFPB initially that, um, brought the enforcement action in its administrative forum. It went through an administrative law judge who had determined a penalty of $6.9 million um, based on a statute of limitations of three years and had basically nullified the safe harbor that HUD had explained in its, um, in, in its advisory opinion in 1997. Although the, the administrative law judge basically made the case that PHH hadn't met its burden of, of satisfying the safe harbor, not that the safe harbor was not available. The appeal, the, the, the next level of appeal for that case was directly to the director, Rich Cordray, who um, was the, basically the sole arbiter of the decision uh, at, the, at the appellate level within the agency's administrative forum. And what, what he did, what the director did on appeal was he looked at the statute of limitations, which had been borrowed from RESPA's normal three-year statute of limitations in civil court, and determined that there was no statute of limitations that applied to the Bureau at, at the administrative level. So really the only limitation that the Bureau had was the authority that it had to take over HUD actions. So they took the, they took the statute of limitations all the way back to 2008. They also issued an opinion that essentially nullified the safe harbor and said that the safe harbor was not available if there is a referral and expectation of return business which was at odds with what HUD had, had issued in writing through guidance back in 1997. And the CFPB more or less said that it was not, that, that HUD guidance was not binding on the Bureau. That was informal guidance issued by another agency when it had authority over, the, over RESPA. The CFPB could change its interpretation and so on. And the end result of this was to up the fine to $119 million from 6.9. So that was a very severe penalty. Um, that was it basically, to, to the point Jonathan made earlier, put PHH in a position where they had no choice but to litigate it and to, and to take it to the D.C. Circuit um, and to enlist the services of uh, a litigator. People may have heard of Ted Olson, who was one of, one of, the, um, um, one of the litigants in the Bush v. Gore case, a premier appellate lawyer, to brief these issues to the D.C. Circuit. Um, most of the, at the time, I was following this case very closely because of the implications it had on RESPA and the mortgage markets, but one of the arguments that they raised was a separation of powers argument. Initially, it was, it was viewed as a throwaway argument, um, but then they got a draw. They, they got a draw of, of two conservative justices, one who is now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and the argument caught weight. They, they, were, they were asked for supplemental briefing on it, and it turned into a case about the constitutionality of the CFPB to everyone's surprise. And initially, the three-judge panel before the D.C. Circuit declared that the CFPB structure was unconstitutional, that it did violate separation of powers because it was abnormal to have so much authority rested in one single director who was not removable by the president. This comes down to a theory that Peter will talk about in a bit called the unitary executive theory, that all executive authority under the executive branch rests with the president, and that there's limitations on Congress's ability to delegate um, executive authority to others, to independent agencies, or to itself. And, you know, at the time, there, was, there, is, there is still a Supreme Court case called the, um, the Humphrey case that was 
that's still on the books and had upheld a commission structure. So before the D.C. Circuit, the, the parties were arguing that um, the commission structure was different than single director because the D.C. Circuit was bound by Supreme Court precedent. That may not be the case at the Supreme Court. Um, th this is a, a predecessor case to the one that we're going to be talking about in a bit. That argument still is, is expected to be argued full, and you know, it, it, it's we, at least one judge who's on the Supreme Court has endorsed it in, in an opinion already. Um, after that opinion was issued, the there was an en banc appeal to the full D.C. Circuit panel. And Peter, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So the Obviously, the um, the three three judge panel found that the the CPB was was on unconstitutional because it you know the the CP Act violated the separation of powers by providing that removal protection for a single director um, and so Judge Kavanaugh then Judge Kavanaugh who had wrote the opinion did distinguish the Humphreys executor case by saying, you know, look, that that was a commission structure. Here we have a single director, you know, a single point of power, and that's that's too much. That's too much discretion that's removed from the president. And the solution, uh, in, in his opinion, was to, to sever that, that provision and, you know, fix the issue by, by then making the CPB director removable at will by the president. Um, so did, Peter, did, did uh, that decision impact any other <clears throat> aspect of the Bureau's uh, activity? No, under his reasoning, it, it wouldn't have. I think it, it, fixing, fixing the, the constitutional problem um, that uh, the opinion found with the, the CPB was, was solution enough. And so it didn't, it didn't result in a windfall relief for, uh, for the defendant or anything like that. Um, uh, obviously, on Banc, uh, the full court had a, a different view and kind of reversed um, uh, that that reasoning and found that the, the CFPB, as currently structured with a single director who does have the you know, current removal protections, was constitutional, did not violate separation of powers, um, and and you know so took that off the table. Um, obviously, Judge Kavanaugh and now Justice. Kavanaugh had a strong dissent um, where he he argued that it's really about um, really about um, individual liberty and protecting the individual from arbitrary decision making and oh, too much discretion held by uh, a person who is not the president. And so, sort of taking that piece of executive power away from the president in a way that, that violated the Constitution. Um, but of course, you know that that case. Had sin, has since resolved itself. PHH did not pursue an appeal up to the Supreme Court. Um, as, as Andy can, can chime in and, and tell everyone, they, they essentially achieved everything they wanted to achieve on the substantive area of the law. I think they, they, they managed to convince the court that the, the CPB's reasoning on RESPA was incorrect um, and got, got relief there. And also the reasoning on the statute of limitations was, was incorrect. Um, and so, having achieved those goals, I think didn't necessarily feel the, the pressure to, that, to follow that, the. That's exactly right. And they they had already litigated up to the D.C. Circuit, and when it was essentially remanded back, they um, with with the, the D.C. Circuit agreeing with the the substantive arguments on RESPA that you know what basically they shouldn't be held in violation of RESPA and the statute of limitations shouldn't go back forever and so on. Um, it, there was really no need to pursue it further. Well, mm -hmm. let's talk about the unitary executive theory. We, we've mentioned it, but let's, let's lay out what it is. Um, Jerry, I, I'd yeah. just like to point out how that is the unitary executive theory is not only significant, but it, it was lurking in the background, but then it comes to the foreground because you have a new president, a new justice department. And that is a very demonstrable difference because in the PHH situation, the agency was defending itself and its constitutionality. Here it flips. And with this theory, you know, uh, Kavanaugh, who was only one, uh, one of the uh, judges involved, it now is, is no longer needs to be the sole driver. Well, let's, let's talk about the unitary executive theory. Um, and, and Peter, do you want to lay out, or Andy, do you want to lay out uh, exactly what this theory is? And, you know, I'll note that at the time of PHH, there were, there were some who noted that 
uh, Director Cordray at the time appeared to be more powerful uh, even than the President of the United States as it related to the financial services sector. Um, so, and how, how does that play into the unitary executive theory? Sure, I, I think we'll, we'll cover it fairly generally and at a high level. Obviously, there's, there's um, reams and reams of, of academic scholarship and legal scholarship on this theory, but it goes back to you know, the, the founders' theories uh, of governance and, and through the Constitution, what, you know, how government should be structured um, and what it meant to have sort of separate branches of government. Um, I think there, there was, um, in some and um, in, in, in strong voices, an idea that you needed a strong single executive uh, who could make decisions and that they came through very clearly through the war powers and needing the president to be the commander in chief of the armed forces and sort of an acknowledgement by, by the founders that it would, it would be difficult to sort of conduct wartime activities by, by committee. Um, you needed a, a president to do that. So that the unitary executive theory, the strong version of it is really that, um, that idea flows through other branches or other areas of executive authority. So it's not just war powers. It's, it's really any, any power of the president to, um, enforce the laws or to ensure that the, the laws are enforced needs to, to rest solely with the president. And so any, any sort of cabining off or, or friction between the president and enforcing those laws or making sure they're carried out uh, essentially violates uh, the separation of powers. Congress can't go in and sort of parcel out the president's, the executive's authority in ways that, that the president wouldn't be able to sort of immediately veto or vote by, by dismissing someone. And the removal power of the president to remove officers of the United States under him or her was really the, that was the seen as one way to exercise that, um, you know, the unitary executive power. And so that, that's the, the strong version of the theory, which you see kind of flowing, you know, through the, the Kavanaugh decision is really, you know, this, is important to liberty. It's important to fundamental aspects of governance in, in America is, is really this idea that you have one decision maker who is accountable um, and there are checks and balances, but you do have one decision maker. You don't have multiple decision makers, at, at, like, like Jerry said, a, a head of an agency who is in some areas more powerful than the president. Um, on the other side, you have a, a weaker unitary executive theory sort of a, a more, more liberal theory where Congress does have much more um, discretion, much more ability to um, structure the government as it sees fit and can, as it goes in, create some, some protections to the removal power to essentially create independent agencies that are, are not necessarily going to be you know, wiped out when the new, a new administration comes in and just replaced with whoever uh, the, the current president wants in place, but we're going to kind of carry on and, and keep doing what they're doing, um, trying to stay somewhat separate from the political sphere. You get this idea of quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial powers. Obviously, the CPB, like many other agencies, creates rules. So they are interpreting statutes that Congress has passed in a way that's that's legally enforceable and is essentially the law of the land. They are, you know, passing judgment. The, the PHH case was initially litigated in the CFPB's administrative forum. So there you have, you know, not in the, the courts, not in the, another branch of government, but within the, the agency itself, you have the administrative law judge who's hearing arguments by the CFPB and the respondents. Um, and then, you know, the ultimate decision maker at that level is the, the, the single director of the CFPB. So you do have a, a judicial um, power kind of vested in an executive or independent agency there. Um, and again, that, that's, that's all of that. If, if the director is not removable at will by the president, that does, you know, move a little bit away from the, the strong unitary executive theory um, because the, the president might, might face some challenges, some friction in, in ousting uh, a CFPB director um, that m maybe, maybe they didn't quite meet the standard, but just uh, the policy you know, directives have changed. And to, to chime in to what Peter said, th this is Andy again, uh, a lot of this comes down to really a single constitutional provision that says the executive power rests with the president. And the, the theory, this, this notion of an administrative state 
where you have these various independent agencies. And it goes well beyond the CFPB. You have the Federal Trade Commission. You have FHFA is another one that's, that's been recently subject to the constitutional challenges, and a host of others, banking regulators and so on, where Congress made the decision that these agencies need to be stable, bipartisan, and not subject to political wins. And so we're going to set them up in a manner where they, they are independent, although they're still technically parts of the executive branch. Um, that didn't really exist when the Constitution was being written, mm -hmm. and it, it probably wasn't even contemplated. Now we're in a position where there's you know, basically debate over what old language means in, in today's environment and whether you, know, you can have an agency like the CFPB where Congress is essentially delegating executive authority to someone other than the president or whether everyone who works for the executive branch essentially works for the president and can be fired by the president or, or, or whatever. That's, that's the debate. Um, it, it is a relatively new debate. You know, it, following history as much as I have, it, it seems like this theory was really developed along with, you know, around the time of the Nixon administration, um, the advent of the Federalist Society and so on. It, it's a conservative train of thought that's given rise to this theory, and then you know there's several judges who ascribe to it, many of whom are now in the Supreme Court. And just to, to chime in there, it, it, to Andy's point, extends far beyond just the CFPB. Really, kind of the, the theory would be applicable widely to the, the entire administrative state. And it, it is, you know, there there are questions, um, and some people feel that you know, agencies really shouldn't, you know, shouldn't exist. It, it, there should be much stricter sort of um, siloing of constitutional authority and the mixing of, of certain authorities and agencies is is not something that was contemplated by the Constitution. But this is, you know, obviously we see a, a microcosm of, of the theory kind of playing out in, in Patriots, but also in, in SALA law now, of course, before the Supreme Court. And, and as we all know, the uh, ultimate determination will come down to the Supreme Court, uh, so which we will talk about our predictions uh, after we discuss the SALA uh, law versus CFPB case. And so let me uh, ask you, Peter, to, to give a background uh, into the SALA law case as to, you know, um, what this debt relief law firm was doing. And, um, you know, quite frankly, I'm not sure even the, the business line even mattered because they, they challenged the CID, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you give us uh, some background on the SALA law case and, and where we stand? Sure. Just some, some quick background. Uh, uh, to your point, now that we're before the Supreme Court on very specific constitutional questions about the Bureau, the, you know, the underlying facts uh, become, become less relevant. Uh, I think to the point that Jonathan and, and Andy made, they are, they are relevant to the extent that it, it, does, it does tell the story of, of how we got here and why. You know, like, like PHH, you know, Salem Law was another entity that was, you know, challenged or pursued by the CPB um, and, likely felt that there was very little out. You know, at PHH, certainly an administrative forum where with no statute of limitations by, by the um, opinion of the director, um, there was just a lot of pressure and a lot of um, feeling that the parties couldn't do anything against the CBB, and it was so aggressive. So that, that I think, it helps set the, the table. But in, in 2017, SALA law um, refused to, to answer a, a civil investigative demand, a CID, by the CFPB. And, and, let's, and let's just note, you know, the challenges to a, C, a, a CFPB CID uh, can only be made on, on a certain number of grounds. Generally speaking, civil investigative demands are, are, are upheld by, by the district courts. There's a, lot, a broad latitude given mm -hmm. to uh, administrative agencies to issue these civil investigative demands or civil subpoenas. Uh, but one of the ways uh, that the Salem law firm challenged it was, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, did, what did they do, Peter? Well, they, they challenged the, the constitutionality of the, of the agency, the ability of this agency to even ask the question. Um, and again, part and parcel because there were so few Alternatives. I think that this, you know, if, if this was one of the one of their shots at getting out of the CID. Well, their name bellies the argument too. So, Sailor Law was, in their view, practicing law and therefore exempt from the authority mm -hmm. of the CFPB in the first instance. So, their position was that the bureau was being over aggressive, even asking. They should not only didn't mm -hmm. have the authority to ask the question, they mm -hmm. were overreaching 
the authority that had already been constricted in the statute itself that said you don't have authority over the practice of law. Mm -hmm. so, um, no, correct. And, and the, with, obviously the petition was denied by Director Cordray. Um, Sailor Law did, did submit some information, um, continued to object. And I, again, you see this theme throughout in these types of cases, also in PHH, where parties are objecting to this overreach and not really receiving any traction within the Bureau or from the Bureau. and you know, that's sort of triggering this, this constitutional um, avenue. And NCIDs are not self-executing documents. So SALA law had the right to say, we're not going to comply with this. You must go, CFPB, go seek to enforce it. But to preserve their rights, they had to file uh, a petition to set aside or mm -hmm. modify with Director Cordray. Of course, mm -hmm. as you noted, Peter, he denied that. And then they went, uh, forced, uh, say the law forced the CFPB to go to district court, mm -hmm. seek a motion to, to compel or an order to compel. And, um, and then say the law appealed it to the Ninth Circuit, which said, uh, tough luck. We, we agree with the district court. And, mm -hmm. and from there, uh, if, if I remember correctly, it, it, uh, it net, well, in fact, I think we all know it ended up before the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that petition was granted, uh, just about a month ago. And we are now in the in the stages of um, of, of so the Supreme Court argument, and, and where are we uh, in the sure? Of that? So um, we're you know, we've got we've got um, oral arguments coming up. We have petitioners and respondents' briefs due uh, later, you know, but but early this month. Um, the, the Amicus Curiae in support of the judgment, which we'll talk about that aspect uh, in a in a few slides. But the, the briefing there is due on January fifteenth. Oral argument is scheduled for March 3rd, and then obviously op opinions um, come out when they come out, but typically uh, at least by the end of the, the court's term, which and, will be late June. And I do want to point out that there is something uh, somewhat unique here, which is that the petitioner and respondent's briefs are both due on the same day. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit atypical, isn't that right? It is, and I, that, I think that, that connects up with the second bullet there where it, we've actually had uh, a party appointed to argue in support of of the um, the merits of the case, and so that I think we'll we'll touch on it in a little bit. But uh, the the CFPB and the DOJ uh, and the administration have have kind of pivoted and and chosen not to to argue that the the bureau is constitutional and that the director uh, and the structure of the bureau um, does not violate the separation of powers. And so because they've kind of Abdicated, stepped back from that argument. The court appointed someone to to make that argument um, for on the argument's behalf. That's why you have the amicus curiae in support of the judgment. And what were the arguments uh, on the next slide that the uh, the CFPB had made in the past that the the current director decided not to continue on with? Uh, in fact, it, mm -hmm. she has come out. Director Craninger has come out and stated that she believes the. Uh, removal only for cause provision is unconstitutional. Um, and and what, what were those arguments, Peter? Sure. You know, as Andy mentioned, it, it's, it's you know, a very kind of a small slice, but a, an important one of the Constitution where you, know, you have Article 2, Section 1 that vests the executive power in the President of the United States, Article 2, Section 3, which requires the President to take care that laws are faithfully executed. Uh, the Constitution does not clearly and expressly set out a separation of powers clause or, or even notion uh, that's sort of drawn from the fact that it vests executive and, you know, legislative and judicial power in separate branches. But there's, there's no clear separation of powers clause. And so, you know, when you, you see that term, it's, it's really referring to these, these sections that parcel out authority to, to govern. Um, so the argument um, has been that you know the the independence of the director uh, prevents the CPB from um, prevents the, the president from fulfilling the duty to take care that laws are faithfully executed because the president, the argument goes, would not be able to uh, go in and, and fire or threaten to fire or you know control a director of an agency um, to enforce the laws the way that the president um, needed them to be enforced in order to faithfully execute the laws and so. You know, the, we have precedent here. Uh, the Supreme Court has, as Andy mentioned, upheld for cause removal provision in other agencies. All, you know, the Humphreys executive case for the FTC involving uh, multi-person commissions. And so this is, 
um, an area that the fact that this is a single director is is kind of the, the new hook here. And I think the parties below, especially in PHH, needed to work around the Supreme Court precedent. As Andy mentioned, now that you're in the Supreme Court, maybe that's less of an issue. Maybe the presidential presidential concerns aren't as strong. Um, although, of course, the, they're still they'll, they'll still be there in some form. Um, the circuit patients are very strong. Correct. Yeah. Um, the circuit split, really, the Ninth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit have upheld the uh, the CPB, have said that the appointment provision does not violate separation powers. The Fifth Circuit, not for the CFPB, but for the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is a another agency um, set up close to the time the Bureau was, you know, recently in 2008, has a similar structure where it's an independent agency with a single uh, head. Um, and the Fifth Circuit held there that the uh, the agency was un- unconstitutional, um, and then you know uh, severed the, that provision and sort of solved the issue that way. So you do have you do have that circuit split that set up the the case for the Supreme Court. Um, you know, just kind of reiterating the actual questions before the court. One is whether the vesting of substantial executive authority in the CPB independent agency led by a single director violates the separation of powers. We've been talking about that the whole time. Um, the second question, which the parties didn't raise, the court actually asked it of the parties and, and um, is, is waiting to, to hear argument on the answers, is whether if the CFP is found to be unconstitutional, the court can sever the, the at-issue provision, the uh, for-cause removal provision from the Dodd-Frank Act. And that gets into, you know, basically what, what is the outcome? If the agency is unconstitutional, do you sever the provision and everything continues to move forward or do you take some, some more drastic action? And as we noted earlier, you know, there is, there will be some argument that um, the four cause provision was purposeful and an integral part to the functionality of the CFPB that prevented, as Andy mentioned, the regulatory capture, so to speak, of, of mm-hmm. what people saw as part of the, the contributing factor to uh, the, the recession of our time, right? the, the most recent recession. And looking, looking back at it, you know, again, referencing the, the PHH case, the en banc um, opinion, Judge Henderson's dissent, a little bit different than, than Kavanaugh's, she also finds that the, the agency was unconstitutional, but finds just that, that um, the the single director whose removal only for cause was an integral part of the law, the statute, the CFPA, and so can't be, can't be severed. Um, and so she would have, she would call for the invalidation of the entire Title 10 of, of the Dodd-Frank Act and everything that falls out from that and sort of put it back to Congress to fix the issue. Um, just Kavanaugh and his dissent and obviously his opinion below, um, you, know, you know, highlighted specifically the CFPB has a severability provision, you know, so it, it does take this into account that you can sever parts of it and the rest of the, the law continues forward. Um, so, you know, focusing primarily on that and, and, you know, some of the more practical issues found that you could sever the, the for-cause removal provision and solve the, the issue that way. Um, so just quickly before we kind of spend, the, I think, the, the remaining of our time going through some of the different iterations of, of how this comes out, just kind of wanted to do a quick overview of the party's arguments. Um, obviously, Salah Law is arguing that the, the you know, structure of the CFPB violates the Constitution and also can't be remedied. So they, the creation of the agency is void and the CP really has no power to enforce its CID. So they're, they're looking for specific relief for them and, and, and their issue um, in responding to the CID. The Justice Department and, and the CFPB have both abdicated a little bit, you know, prior positions and said that the they agree the structure does violate separation of powers um, with the four cause removal provision, and their remedy would be to sever it. Um, Craner, Director Craninger has had made, has made statements and, and letters to Congress that said that the the CFPA, the law, should remain fully operational. CFPB is continuing its daily activities, and in, in her view, wouldn't be affected by this. Obviously, other than herself being being removable at will by the president, um, uh, their position in state law and others would still be required to follow the process um, that CFPB initiated, in that, their case, CIDs, and that regulatory and supervisory enforcement activities would continue unchanged. Um, I, I just think it's fascinating that, you know, I think Craniger would probably 
be more than willing to step down if the president asked her to. So at the end of the day, um, they're trying to codify now through the court action what would be their general philosophy of uh, organizational principle of operating the executive branch as it is in this administration. So mm -hmm. more or less, um, this is as much a proxy fight for other government agencies as it would be for one that they actually have somewhat captive control over. No, and, and you know, it's it's interesting, but it's also an issue, and I think Craninger's mentioned this, that CFPB has an interest in getting resolved. I think it, it does begin to become a burden to have these challenges hanging out over the agency, and as we've mentioned kind of earlier, every time you issue a CID or you know, engage in enforcement action that uh, there, there's some hook to say you've, you've overreached or, or something like that, you get this, you get this argument um, thrown into the briefing and then it, it kind of gets caught up in the logjam of constitutional arguments um, about the CFPB. And so I think she's, there, there is a practical element to them wanting it resolved. Um, obviously, they, they, could, they could continue to argue that it, they're constitutional con constitutional and resolve it that way, but uh, I think there, there, is, there is an impetus to get this resolved sooner rather than later. Um, and just wanted to quickly touch the, the judgment itself, the Ninth Circuit um, opinion, um, there was appointed an amicus curiae to, to argue that, that opinion, um, and I think Meredith had a little bit you wanted to say on, on that. Uh, sure. So, uh, Attorney Paul Clement, the former Solicitor General, has been appointed as the amicus. Um, and, and why is that? Oh, well, because the Justice Department has uh, abdicated its position that it took in the Ninth Circuit below. It and the law firm are now aligned, essentially, in their arguments on the constitutionality of the Bureau um, and the, the director's uh, removal provision. And so in order to defend the judgment's honor, the court agreed to appoint um, a very skilled attorney to advocate on behalf of the Ninth Circuit's opinion. And so that's Paul Clement. There, there's been some you know, industry scuttlebutt about that appointment. Um, Clement has a reputation for being a very conservative uh, legal scholar. Um, some, some have written that this was a deliberate choice on behalf of the court. And I think Judge uh, Justice Kagan was the official appointee of, of Clement um, in order to try to depoliticize this issue a bit. Um, the thinking being that if a more liberal uh, attorney or um, advocate were appointed, that it, it could bring some of these um, sideshow issues into the case, which I think the court wants to try to avoid. And so um, that leads to this sort of unique scheduling where both the government's and the law firm's briefs are due on the same day, essentially because they're expected to have similar, uh, if not entirely identical positions. I think that the law firm would argue that the, the um, you know, maybe something a little bit more extreme than, than the, the, the Bureau and the Justice Department itself, but uh, Clement's amicus brief will be due after that, um, responding to the arguments that they make uh, opposed to the removal provision. And then, so that leaves us with, with what we see as uh, three potential uh, scenarios for the, for the outcomes. Uh, and, and one is that the Supreme Court would, would uphold the Ninth Circuit's opinion, affirm the constitutionality of the CFPB, uh, and basically settle the issue with, with no impact on the CFPB's authorities or its activities. Uh, that, that's scenario one. Um, um, and then scenario two is that the Supreme Court would say, hey, this four-cause provision is severable, and um, the, the, the director is removable at will by, by the president, uh, the same way the FBI director, the CIA director, the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, or, or other uh, single director agencies um, are set up. Um, and then the, the third scenario is, is uh, for lack of a better way to put it, almost a, a nuclear option. It's the Supreme Court saying that the CFPB structure is unconstitutional. Um, that the four cause removal removal provision is not severable, and that the Dodd Frank Act uh, Title Ten is is unconstitutional, uh, and that would unwind or undo a great deal of the law. The that I call it the the nuclear option because uh, 
if that occurs, it, it would be um, it would have significant impacts for the agency itself, obviously, and all of its employees. It would have a significant impact for other agencies whose authorities were transferred to the CFPB, and it would have uh, a significant impact on the industry if, for example, uh, all of the rules uh, that are regulations that have been written by the CFPB were thrown out the window, um, uh, and we went back to a sort of pre-mortgage market uh, meltdown or, or economic recession time frame in, in the sense of the regulatory framework for the country. Um, and, and so we're going to walk through what we think, how we think that could play out for, for CFPB enforcement actions, state enforcement and litigation, and uh, regulatory uh, activity or rulemaking activity. And when we look at the CFPB enforcement actions, you know, if, if everything stays the same, there's, there's going to be no impact. If it is a uh, if the removable for cause provision is is severed, um, the way Justice Kavanaugh recommended when he was sitting in the in the D.C. Circuit, then um, that also would would not have too much of an impact. Um, I say too much because I would still imagine that there might be some litigation depending on how the opinion comes out by the Supreme Court. People could still try to re uh, litigate, you know, past settlements with the enforcement office or or other things to that nature. Um, if, if the Supreme Court finds that the CFPB is entirely unconstitutional, uh, the way a Southern District of New York uh, uh, District Court judge did in CFPB versus uh, RD legal funding, um, then that would have significant, could have significant impacts for past enforcement actions. And you know, one of the questions that that uh, I don't think anyone necessarily has an answer for at this point would be, what would happen to to past penalties or or other provisions? What would happen to past consumer redress that the CFPB pushed out to consumers? Would all of that be be clawed back? Would all of that have to have to come back? Would defendants get uh, money back from the government that they paid for civil money penalties or or paid for restitution? Would consumers have to turn back over money that they've now been given and, and likely spent? Uh, what, what what do you guys think? Well, and, and one one question is if the ultimate remedy were to basically kick the statute back to Congress and have Congress address the deficiency, would Congress be able to agree on a solution and would they do it in a timely manner? And what would happen to the status quo while that was happening? Would there be some kind of a grace period? Would, and we, we, we won't know these things until there's an opinion. And I mean, to be clear, I, I think very few are predicting that that's going to be the outcome. I think most, most of the prognosticators that, that we hear think the ultimate outcome is most likely to be a, sever a severability of the for cause provision. And there, I think the impact is, is much more minimal. No, nothing has to go back to Congress. But if it did, who knows how long that would take, what it would look like. You know, it, it's, it's clearly a very contentious time on the Hill these days. Very well put. Um, well, there's, there's another factor here, though. I mean, as attorneys, we're all geared to looking at legal arguments and the nuances. But at the end of the day, this is really a, a timing question and, a, in some respects, a political question, too, because if the Supreme Court comes out in any way other than upholding the statute as written, and even if it does, it's really a question of who is going to be the director and who has the ability to appoint the director. And depending on what happens next, uh, next November, uh, and if there's a change in administration, um, what authority or uh, persuasion does that president want to have uh, over the agency? And so one way or another, the real question is, is, is would there be uh, an appointee of the Trump administration or some other administration if the election goes the opposite direction? And so there's a, a real timing issue here, too. It's a, I mean, essentially a perfect storm because this is going to be unfolding during the presidential uh, uh, primary season, uh, potentially with a decision coming out slightly before or around um, the, the general election season. So uh, in many respects, depending on where somebody's situated, uh, whether there's enforcement that might be pending, if somebody's sitting with a CID on their desk, um, and, or a rulemaking they'd like to see happen or not happen, um, there's a lot of different permutations much of which come down to you know, who will actually be running the agency, not necessarily who has the authority. Because I, in my view, 
um, I, I think the, the writing's already on the wall that if the administration wants to place a new director in, they will. They've already done it twice now. So um, it's more of a question of the philosophy of who's running the agency as much as it is who has the ability and authority to appoint it. Well, let's talk about uh, the current agency, uh, the current, current bureau and the ongoing enforcement actions. Um, you know, will this litigation have an effect on it? Uh, on any ongoing enforcement actions. And, and you know, there are a number of uh, on litigation um, matters where parties have sought a stay. Uh, I am not aware of any successful stays being granted um, pending the, the uh, outcome, except for the, the SELA law case. Um, uh, most uh, district courts are not staying the litigation. Um, uh, it, in, in our experience, um, uh, the unconstitutionality of the CPP is being used to challenge civil investigative demands um, uh, that can be inserted to preserve an argument in the future, contingent on how the Supreme Court decides. Uh, but it's highly unlikely that would stop the CFPB from issuing uh, or seeking to enforce a civil investigative demand. Um, in fact, we have seen no, um, we have not seen a stop in CFPB civil investigative demands being issued. Uh, we continue to see them being issued to 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 clients uh, and and of course that has to be a process that has to be managed. Um, so the outcome on the CFEB, you know, will largely depend, at least in the enforcement angle, will largely depend on on exactly what the Supreme Court opinion does. And Meredith, what do you think will happen with uh, state enforcement and litigation, uh, especially uh, as a as you look at at what the Supreme Court may do in in, in light of your state AG and other practices. Sure. We haven't, to date, seen a real difference in the, the, the state activity, you know, given all of the swirl around the CFPB. They've continued to issue their own subpoenas. They've continued to pursue their own investigations. They've continued to be aggressive. They don't seem at all threatened by any sort of CFPB power or overreach. Um, there have been some interesting uh, developments in the relationships between the state AGs and the CFPB. Um, for example, uh, a contingent of red state AGs have filed amicus briefs in connection with the SALA case and with a, um, a Fifth Circuit case that's pending cert at the moment called the All-American Check Cashing. Um, they support the positions of the uh, defendants in those cases stating that the CFPB's removal provision is unconstitutional and um, also going so far as to say that any activity, uh, because the CFPB was invalid, any activity arising out of the CFPB is invalid as well. Um, so they go they go further than, than the Bureau itself does on, on what should happen if the Bureau's, uh, if the, the Director's removal provision is deemed unconstitutional. Um, also, just in the last six months, there have been a number of, of instances where state attorneys general have written to the bureau, to the director, um, offering comments and, and other feedback on proposed rules and other activities that the, the bureau has been advocating. Um, for example, in June, Pennsylvania's attorney general, Josh Shapiro, submitted a statement to the CFPB um, arguing that the Bureau should not promulgate a rule or guidance to clarify the meaning of abusiveness under the CFPA. Um, this stems from Director Kraninger's uh, suggestion that because abusiveness is not um, a provision that's very well defined and, and could be su subject to uh, ambiguity by the courts, that it may be worthwhile to, to try to clarify what it means. Um, the AGs, uh, at least to the Democratic AGs, I think, um, oppose that clarification. I think they enjoy the breadth of the abusiveness uh, standard and their ability to invoke the CFPA in their own investigations and enforcement actions. And so cabining in abusiveness to be more limited than um, sort of the, the loosey-goosey definition that exists right now would not be um, advantageous to the the the, the AGs who want to take a very expansive view of their enforcement um, authority under the, the CFP, CFPA. Um, there was actually a bipartisan coalition of state AGs that um, 
sent a comment letter to the Bureau on the debt collection rule, and I know Jonathan's going to speak a little bit about that later. Um, one of the themes was that <clears throat> the, the proposed amendments to, to the rule would um, conflict with more uh, restrictive rules that states have implemented with respect to call frequency and attorney involvement. And so they submitted a letter um, asking the commenting on the CFPB's proposal and suggesting that it doesn't go far enough to protect consumers. And that was 28 state AGs, so it goes you know, beyond just the, the, um, the Dems. Um, <clears throat> the AGs also have taken positions with respect to the Bureau's uh, proposals or, or requests for comments on HMDA reporting, uh, both on the scope of the data that's collected and also the thresholds uh, that apply as to who needs to submit that data. So um, the AGs have suggested that it does not make sense to roll back the additional data points that the Bureau implemented um, in 2015 that give additional context into the um, identity or demographics of borrowers and the types of loans that they're receiving. Um, similarly, uh, in New York has filed a letter to the Bureau as well suggesting that it doesn't it isn't prudent to increase the number of loans that an uh, originator has to make before they're required to pr produce HMDA data because that'll substantially limit the state's abilities to monitor lending and to make sure that their consumers and their constituents are protected. But at the same time, states and the CFPB are also working together. <coughs> Excuse me, there are enforcement actions that are continuing. There are settlements that are continuing. Just in the last six months or so, there have been, um, I think, at least five enforcement actions that the CFPB and states have worked together on to gain settlements from operators in the financial services space, um, including um, loan providers, uh, debt collectors, and uh, other lenders. They have a focus, uh, a shared interest in protecting service members and, and, and enforcing rules around charities that are supposed to benefit service members. And so there is this interesting dichotomy in their relationship and that the states you know, do continue to take issue with some of the CFPB's policies under the new administration, but also do continue to work in tandem with them to protect consumers. Thank you, Meredith, and uh, for that perspective on state enforcement actions. Um, Andy uh, and Peter, wh how, what do you see playing out uh, in the supervisory context? How do you think that uh, the SELA litigation could impact uh, supervisory examinations, past, current, or present? Well, or past, current, or future? I guess there's, there's two things. There's one, if the outcome of SELA is essentially the outcome of the D.C. Circuit on bonk appeal, where status quo remains with no change at all. I, I, I see no change. Um, I, honestly, the, the same if the, if the director is removable for cause. Um, you had mentioned, Jerry, there could be some attempts to go back and relitigate enforcement actions or stall enforcement actions. I don't see that in the supervisory context. Uh, supervisory relationships are ongoing. And, you know, to the extent that there are examination findings, they tend to be confidential. They're between you and your regulator. Most of the companies who are regulated by the CFPB and have undergone exams and had supervisory findings have more or less worked things out with them. Um, CFPB has an escalation process where bad exam findings can turn into enforcement actions. So I, I really see very little movement on the supervisory front unless you know something happens where the authority to regulate institutions goes away then that yeah, that's that's an entirely different issue um and you know there it's it's really unclear what the outcome would be right well it's, especially i think supervisory authority is is really an area where it's not as splashy as enforcement actions but it was a, a big change for especially non-banks financial institutions financial companies who had not previously been subject to examination the same way a bank or a credit union would be to then go through that process. And so there, there were, you know, there's a lot of change in industry because of that. And I think it's the points that Meredith highlighted, the, just the fact that the, the CFPB and existed for so long has become so integral to the market, you know, passing regulations and um, having authorities that state, you know, law enforcement agents and regulators use and rely on and, you know, conducting the whole supervisory arm of, of the Bureau and, and especially for non-banks, um, it's just, it would be a lot 
to unravel. And it, to Andy's point, it's it's not at all obvious exactly how that would play out. Um, and again, I think that's why um, we kind of refer to it as the nuclear option because it, it, it there are, there is a lot of uncertainty just because it has become integral at the state level, integral at the you know, supervisory level. Um, and you can imagine that institutions that uh, entered into confidential supervisory uh, memorandums of, of understanding or other uh, or took other action would prefer to keep that confidential versus bringing that out to the public to somehow undo that. No, and they're not going to relitigate their exam findings just because they have an opportunity to that's likely to fail, right? That's, that's going to do little more than make your examiners unhappy with you, and that's usually not a good approach to supervision. Well put. Um, so, Jonathan, let's talk a little bit to, to sort of end our presentation uh, about rulemaking um, and how do you think that the SELA litigation uh, could impact some of the proposed rules that are pending with the CFPB, for example, payday, uh, the payday or small dollar lending rule and uh, the, the debt collection practices rulemaking. Uh, and, and we'll leave the QM patch question for, for Andy and, and uh, Peter. Well, there's, you know, there's no question that the uh, CFPB's constitutionality and the questions of that raise some significant questions for really all sectors that are covered by the CFPB. Um, you know, from a compliance standpoint in any one of these areas, I, you know, it's generally business as usual until there's some actual definite change, if, if any. I think we've all concluded that that's really unlikely in the grand scheme of things, um, although it really does come down to who's the director and what's the philosophy of the organization more than anything else. We've seen that play out already. And that's played out also in the rulemaking context. Um, and so we just need to look at just not, not too distant past um, to see how important it is as to who's actually running the agency as to what the, how the rulemakings pan out. In the debt collection context, you'd had a rule that was essentially announced over five, six years ago um, even longer in some cases um, for the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, uh, which over 40-year history had never had uh, a rule written under it because the FTC didn't have rulemaking authority. Uh, Cordray um, goes through this long, drawn-out process uh, for a multifaceted uh, dual-part rule for uh, third-party and first-party collections, has Sabrifa small business review panels, uh, and a whole host of um, town hall type uh, PR events and uh, announcements. And then Mulvaney comes in and now with, with Cranger and the uh, NPRM that was released uh, about nine months ago and it's just had its comment uh, period close about three months ago, uh, entirely flipped it on its, uh, turned it on, on its head and uh, had a rule now that is just focused on third party and on modernizing uh, the, uh, the state of the law in the industry as, a, as opposed to being relatively punitive. And um, you know, that rule um, is in all likelihood uh, slated to have its comments processed and some sort of um, a new announcement, whether it be uh, additional comment or maybe a final rule proposal uh, or announced final rule in 2020. Um, so timing is key here. Um, if they can get it in under um, any potential change uh, in an administration um, or authority to remove Crander uh, for cause or without cause, um, that's probably preferable. But that, that's really up in the air. That schedules in some parts, some, in many ways, out of the CFPB or anybody in the industry or consumer group's hands. But I think it will be uh, significant um, in the scheduling that the small dollar lending uh, rule, which is more perhaps of a, a, a retraction, um, is slated to be announced uh, sometime in uh, late winter, spring uh, 2020, um, which could come in and undo what the Cordray administration of the CFPB had proposed with respect to the, the lending rule. So it, it's a timing question. Um, in the debt collection context, um, you know, they, the Bureau clearly will need time to get through its comments, but I think it would be probably to everybody's advantage to have that done prior to uh, what potentially could be a change in administration. Um, of course, if there isn't, then uh, perhaps it's a non-issue. So uh, to add to what Jonathan said, 
QM is one of the rules that's up there. What's going on at the CFPB now and the rulemaking capacity is largely industry friendly. Um, the you know the, the payday rulemaking is being rolled back to, to be more friendly to installment lenders and, and to payday lenders. The you know the QM patch is something that has to be addressed. Um, I, I think if there were an obliteration of the agency's rulemakings by declaring Title 10 unconstitutional but not Title 14, that would probably be the, a bigger disaster to the mortgage industry than what happened prior to the crisis, <laughs> because there there's you know there there's a statute that's still in effect or a statutory provision with no rules to follow. Much of what's happening at the CFPB now is clarifications, rollbacks of those rules, and so on. And if, you know, let, let's say, for example, Craninger, Craninger's appointment is declared removable for no cause, just at the will of the president, business as usual. Anything that's in the proposal stage and moving forward continues. Anything in the past, if it needs to be ratified, can be ratified, otherwise it's still law. And keep in mind that the, the, the major rule makings the CFPB's done over the years, the industry spent hundreds of millions of dollars to comply with. They don't want to return to the status quo ante, right, at, at this point. It, it's The systems are designed around the rules. The rules are really here to stay. And if anything, you know, there, there would be some kind of a, you know, some kind of a ratification of them if, if, if there's any change at all. There may not be any change. If there is some kind of a, a catastrophic event where the CFPB as an agency goes away, I think there, there would be a lot of reckoning within the industry. Um, and there'd be a lot of uncertainty around what the law is, where there's private rights of actions with no safe harbors and so on. So I think that's all the more reason that's unlikely to happen. Thank you, Andy. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who presented, uh, Meredith, Andy, Jonathan, and Peter. And to everyone listening, please let us know if you have any questions. You can reach out to us through the chat system uh, or, or through email, I believe. Uh, we would also like to highlight uh, our next presentation, which is the Consumer Financial Services Outlook for 2020. Uh, that is a presentation where we will give uh, our uh, outlook on, on the financial services industry, including the CFPB, the FTC, and state regulators uh, as it applies to uh, everything within the industry moving forward uh, into 2020. We hope you can join us for that. Uh, and as I said, we thank you for your time.